It's time now to turn to colorectal cancer. Immunotherapy offers some promising new treatments for some patients with this type of cancer. Here to tell us about the latest advances in colorectal cancer immunotherapy are Drs. Luis Diaz and Andrea Surchek. Dr. Diaz is head of the Division of Solid Tumor Oncology and the Grayer Family Chair. And Dr. Surchek is the section head in rectal, anal, appendiceal cancers, young onset colorectal cancer, and colon geosarcoma at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. Brian Brewer from the Cancer Research Institute will be sharing your questions with Drs. Diaz and Surchek, so please be sure to put them in the Q&A box. Welcome, doctors, and thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you, Tamarin, and thank you, CRI, for this opportunity to speak to you a bit about colorectal cancer and immunotherapy. There's been tremendous uh, strides in the therapy of colorectal cancer with immunotherapy um, really over the past 10 years. And those strides have occurred primarily in the subset of cancers that are called microsatellite unstable or microsatellite instability high. So colon cancer really comes into two different forms. One is microsatellite stable and one is microsatellite unstable. The microcellite stable tumors are the most common ones. Um, they're typically the ones that, um, that do not respond to immunotherapy. And when you look at them under the microscope, they look like the immune system is excluding them or like the immune system is ignoring them altogether. Um, and, and what this does is sets up a scenario where they may be more responsive to chemotherapy. They may be more responsive to potentially radiotherapy and surgery, uh, whereas these other tumor types microsolid instability high, also called mismatch repair deficient tumors, um, are, have features that make them more susceptible to immunotherapy. One of the features, features is that they have a lot of mutations in them that they've developed over many, many years. And those mutations is actually what the immune system attacks. The other thing is, is when you look under the microscope, there are literally thousands of immune cells invading these tumors. But these immune cells aren't making anything happen. They're just there and they recognize the tumor as foreign, but they need something else to act, to actually attack the tumor and make it go away. If we think of the landscape of colorectal cancer, and we look at all early and late stage colorectal cancers, the current thinking is, is that about 85% of tumors are microsatellite stable, and the unstable or microsatellite instability high, mismatch repair deficient, are about 15%. If you look at those 15%, about 10 to 15% are what's called Lynch syndrome or the hereditary form of mismatch repair. And the other 85% are sporadic, meaning they just happen uh, in nature and they're not related to any sort of hereditary impact. So what does it take to unlock the immune system to attack the tumors that are micro instability high and in many cases eradicate them? Well, it's, it, it comes down to the type of immunotherapy, and the immunotherapies are checkpoint inhibitors. And what are che immune checkpoints? Well, when the immune system it sees a very robust immune response uh, or, or something that looks foreign or something that wants to get rid of, the checkpoints are upregulated to keep the immune system from going overboard. So we just want the immune system, typically, if there's a cell invaded by a virus, to kill that cell with the virus and not everything around it. The body has developed a system to turn off the immune system so it doesn't go overboard. Well, cancer cells have developed a mechanism to do that themselves. They'll say, you know, I want to be invisible to the immune system. So I'm going to upregulate these immune checkpoints, and these immune checkpoints will let me continue to grow unbothered by the immune system. But what was remarkable is over the past 15 to 20 years, and even longer, many scientists have been studying these immune checkpoints and blocking them, and blocking them with antibodies. And that turns a tumor from being invisible to the immune system to being visible by the immune system. So a tumor like mismatch repair deficient tumor can be cleared and, and, and shrink and maybe even be eliminated when you add these checkpoint inhibitors. And what these checkpoint inhibitors are, are these things called monoclonal antibodies 
that interfere with the binding of these immune checkpoints. So the cells, tumor cells in this case, can no longer be invisible. And there are four immune checkpoints that are currently approved, actually five, um, but the ones that are approved for colorectal cancer and immune uh, mismatch repair deficient tumors or microcellular high tumors are ipilimumab, called Urevoy, nivolumab, Opdivo, pembrolizumab, Keytruda, and dostarlamab. Um, there are others coming, but these are very effective in mismatch repair deficient colorectal cancer, and they work in the metastatic setting where more than half of the patients who previously didn't have any effective therapies um, have done incredibly well with immune checkpoint blockade. And then in the early stage of cancer, when it can be surgically resected, um, myself and Dr. Sursek, who you'll hear from in a minute, conducted a study where we were able to eliminate these tumors uh, just with immune therapy itself. So this is really what I'd consider the first step in harnessing the immune system for the therapy of cancer. And what I think that we've begun to see is that when we have a subset of cancer that's genetically defined by mismatch repair deficiency, we're not only able to, under the microscope, show that it's highly immunogenic, but that it can respond to immunotherapy like checkpoint blockade. However, there's a lot more to learn here. We need to understand the role of the microbiome. And what does that mean? It means bacteria, viruses, and fungi. And what role does that play in the immune response to immune checkpoint blockade, especially in mismatch deficiency? Are there other biomarkers that we can look at, other things that we can look at in the tumor that are going to tell us, oh, you're going to respond really well, or maybe you're not going to respond, so we, look, we should look elsewhere. And really, the goal is to extend the benefit that we've seen in mismatch repair deficiency, which has been really tremendous and unprecedented in oncology. Um, and we want to extend it to all the other patients that don't have this mutational signature. Um, so we're really excited to, to talk about that. Um, and it's really just the first step in what immunotherapy will do in the therapy of cancer in the future. Dr. Diaz, thank you so much for that uh, account on what's happening in colorectal cancer immunotherapy. Um, it's great to hear that uh, we have found uh, a certain subset of patients who respond, those with that MSI high mutation, uh, but of the majority, as you pointed out, are not responding in the same way uh, to immunotherapy or that particular type of immunotherapy. And so a lot of work is going on and uh, very thrilled to have joining us your colleague, Dr. Sursik, uh, who is out there treating patients and uh, with immunotherapy and can share that perspective. So welcome, Dr. Sursik, to this uh, breakout session on colorectal cancer. It's my pleasure to so be we'll here. Thank start. you so much for having me. Wonderful. So we'll start with some questions that were pre-submitted at the time of registration for this event. And I encourage those of you who are watching now, whether you're watching our broadcast on November 12th or if you're accessing this on demand at a later date, to uh, either put your questions in the Q&A box on the screen that you see, or email us at patients at cancerresearch.org if you have questions. Uh, we're here all year round and uh, are happy to answer. So let's get started uh, with some of these questions. When in a colorectal cancer patient's treatment journey, does immunotherapy become an option? That's a really important question. So as Dr. Diaz described, the population of patients with colorectal cancer that our MSI high or mismatch repair deficient um, is a population that benefits from immunotherapy. And in those patients, it's really important to know that right from the beginning of their cancer journey, especially in metastatic disease, but we're learning even more that even in early stage disease, those patients that are MSI high can benefit from immunotherapy. So we try our best to check for what's called MSI high status with sequencing of the tumor or mismatch repair deficiency right when we meet our patients, when they're first diagnosed. Are these tests, uh, I mean, you're at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, one of the premier uh, research and treatment hospitals uh, in cancer. So this is, this is, of course, these tests are done. Are these tests part of standard care for uh, patients, for instance, who are in other parts of the country or uh, going to see a community oncologist rather than a major research center? Do they need to ask for these tests? 
No, they should not have to ask for them. Um, they are standard of care and should routinely be done. Yeah, if, I, if I can add to that, you know, the, these, uh, these tests were originally developed to detect hereditary colorectal cancer. And so there's already a standard of care um, recommendation that all colorectal cancer patients get tested because this may flag people who have hereditary colorectal cancer. So it's not that far of a jump for um, doctors all across the world really to do this testing. And it's not expensive. It's not as expensive as genetic sequencing or anything like that. It's just a, a simple antibody test that, um, that really everyone with a diagnosis of colorectal cancer should get. So this is, a, it's a blood test then that, that you're talking about. No, it's actually a, a, it's actually a test on the tumor tissue itself. And what they do is they remove the tumor tissue or take a biopsy and they cut slides and the pathologists can look under the microscope and do special stains and they can detect mismatch pair deficiency or not. If they do, two things can happen. Number one, you should be tested for her the hereditary form. And number two, if the tumor is still in place or you have metastatic disease, you should be treated with immunotherapy. You mentioned hereditary uh, colorectal cancer, and we do have a question. Uh, colorectal cancer seems to run in my family. I'm 45 years old. How often should I be screened? And is there a preventive immunotherapy, like a vaccine I should consider getting before cancer develops? So I can take the first part of the question, Luis, if you want to touch on the vaccine portion. Um, if Regardless of whether or not colorectal cancer runs in your family and you are 45 or older, you should have uh, a screening colonoscopy. So insurance now covers age 45 and above. Um, if colorectal cancer runs in the family, then it depends a bit on what age the individuals who had colorectal cancer developed the cancer compared to yourself. So at the age of 45, certainly you should have a colonoscopy. But if a relative, a parent developed it, even younger than that, then you should get screened 10 years younger. And then importantly, as Dr. Diaz just mentioned, um, you should also undergo genetic testing to see if you might as well have this hereditary predisposition. Yeah, and I think just to add to what Dr. Shursik said and then just touch upon the vaccine, um, I can't stress the importance of if, there, if you do find a hereditary mutation or you're at risk for finding one, it kind of has a halo effect because it not only protects you, but it protects the rest of the family. And those that do have that mutation, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to get cancer, but it does put you on a pathway for a little more intensive screening. So you can detect the cancer if it's going to develop sooner, if your family has a higher risk, or if they find a gene mutation associated with that. And it's in those very patients, as well as in general population, where there are ongoing efforts to develop a vaccine to prevent the initiation development of cancer. And so I think that we will be seeing that down the road. It's a little bit harder to test those than even cancer therapeutics because you need a longer period of time to see if the cancer develops or not. So very good, very good. So forewarned is forearmed and uh, keeping that, uh, staying on top of your screening seems to be, because I like with all cancers, uh, I imagine the earlier you catch colorectal cancer, the better your chance, okay. Uh, That's right. So it's just, I think it's especially true with colorectal cancer. Um, and there's a lot of data on the colonoscopy, but I think it's uh, I think it's one of the four interventions that really are very good at screening for colon, for cancer. The, the sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy for colon cancer, low dose CT scans for people who are at risk for lung cancer from smoking uh, over 20 pack years, pap mm -hmm. smears for cervical cancer and then skin exams for melanoma and other cutaneous malignancies. And I think those are four approaches that you should get because they've been shown to not only detect cancer earlier, but improve survival. Uh, you mentioned the microbiome before, and this seems to be an emerging area of intense interest, uh, understanding how the bacteria and viruses in your gut interact with the immune system and affect your outcomes uh, responses to treatment with checkpoint blockade immunotherapy. Can you say a little bit more about that? And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, we often get a lot of questions about nutrition and 
probiotics and what can people do to create kind of a good microbiome. And we know this is just a big topic in colorectal cancer and would love to hear your thoughts on what patients should know about this and whether there's anything in their control they can do to improve their chances of responding to immunotherapy. Uh, you know, I can, I can start with that one because I think both Andre and I, in our research and our clinical care, we touch upon that. Um, and if you just take a step back and say, what is the role of the microbiome? And when we say microbiome, we mean the bacteria that lives on our skin and our GI tract that's normally there, or the viruses that do the same, or fungi that do the same. I'm not going to include protozoans and other parasites. That, we'll leave that aside. But if we take those three classes, do they have a role in the initiation of cancer? Do they have a role in the progression and metastasis of cancer? And then finally, do they have a role in the therapy and either augmenting or blocking the benefit of therapy in cancer? And I think the, all of that is in active investigative mode. And we have hints that they may play a role, but we don't have anything concrete. And there is data to show that certain bacterial um, species are associated with colorectal cancer, especially certain anaerobic forms. Um, there is data to suggest that it's involved in the metastasis and may even travel with the metastasis in the tumor. And then there's data to suggest that it might augment certain therapies and it might detract from others. And so all of those are areas of investigation. Um, there are hypotheses that we either have to prove to be correct or to prove to be incorrect. Um, and so it, it's exciting because it might be something that we can modulate and where we can change the outcome of uh, uh, patient outcomes, uh, but it's still very early too. Dr. Sirsik, yeah, I would add to that in terms of prevention, um, you know, the question of, can I take a probiotic? I don't want to get cancer, or I just was diagnosed with cancer, survived cancer. How can I affect my microbiome with a probiotic? We, we really don't know. The answer is we don't know which probiotics are the right ones to take. We don't even know if they actually make a difference. Um, so it's, it's really impossible to, you know, have a recommendation on that end. And the best we can do is just recommend a healthy, well-balanced diet at this time, just because so, so little is known. Let's see. Here's a question uh, from one of our audience members. Uh, it's about uh, colorectal cancer being diagnosed at earlier ages. Uh, it says, I'm 28 years old. I was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer. Uh, it was very shocking to me because I thought this was a cancer that typically affected older people. But now I realize and have learned that many younger people are now being diagnosed with colon cancer. Why is that? So, you know, so this is another, you know, one of the prime reasons that Dr. Shershik is joining us is that she is the world's expert on this topic. And so, Andrea, you should take, take this. So my, my answer, unfortunately, is we don't know. Um, but that is absolutely true that, that this is happening. And it's actually happening across the entire world. It's a global phenomenon. It's not unique to the United States. We've been seeing this gradual but steady rise since the mid 1990s. Um, so the birth cohort of like 1960 and up in that group, it's been rising by a few percent and the cancers are mostly left sided or rectal, less right sided than we are, tend to see in people in their 60s and 70s. Um, but the reason is really unknown. There's a number of suspects, including the microbiome, potential changes in the environment, something we're ingesting that might be changing our microbiome, changing our, our intestinal lining, um, but, but the actual, you know, potentially things like a more sedentary lifestyle, um, just ingesting fast foods, more processed foods, but nothing has really been identified as, as the sole culprit. We, what we believe is that there is probably something environmental that everyone is exposed to in, in this group, in this age group now, but for some reason there are still individuals that are at risk for it. So there is a certain inherent risk factor. But what we don't know is that, um, well, what we do know rather is that this is not hereditary. So it's not due to things like more limb syndrome or some new hereditary um, uh, phenomenon that we, we haven't identified. This really looks like sporadic cancer or, or random cancer that we're used to seeing in people in their 60s and 70s. So something has just changed gradually um, to the point that now we're seeing many, many more young patients 
Um, and the highest rise actually is, is in people between the age of 20 to 30. Um, so a lot of research is, is, is actively ongoing in this area. Extremely, extremely young. I mean, it's never a good age to get cancer, but uh, that, that this is developing in younger people is, is disturbing. And I hope that we find out exactly what's going on uh, you did mention earlier that immunotherapy is also now shown to be effective at earlier stages of colorectal cancer. Uh, can you say more about that? And how is this changing treatment plans for cancer patients? What we knew about immunotherapy in the MSI high or mismetropyr deficient colorectal cancer patients, as Dr. Diaz described, is that it worked very well when patients had advanced disease. We saw significant improvement, good responses. Many patients were cured. Um, and what we saw in our patients with early stage disease, so early stage rectal cancer and colon cancer, and in our case, rectal cancer in particular, um, was that our standard treatment did not work as well in this population. And, and what that meant is, is patients that have rectal cancer are treated with a combination of chemotherapy radiation and surgery. And we really need to do all three of those modalities to uh, cure them. And when we treated our patients that had MSI high early stage rectal cancer with chemotherapy, we saw that about 30% um, of them or so actually progressed on the chemotherapy, meaning their tumors grew or they responded briefly and then came right back with the mengens. And this was very different than what we saw in our mismetropyr proficient group. Um, and then they did fine with radiation and with surgery, and many of them were cured, but they still had to suffer the consequences of having a radiated pelvis, which for many people meant um, difficulties with bowel movements, bladder function, sexual function, and infertility, which is becoming increasingly more important because of this early age of, of colorectal cancer and particularly rectal cancer patients. Um, and so our idea was, could we take this standard approach of curative treatment for rectal cancer, but in this MSI high population, replace the chemotherapy portion with immunotherapy, with a PD-1 inhibitor called the Starlimab that Dr. Diaz described, and give them just the immunotherapy alone first. So these were, these were um, stage two or three patients. They did not have metastatic disease, and they received six months of immunotherapy. And then our thinking was, well, we'll assess them after the six months and see what happened to the tumor. If the tumor was completely gone after immunotherapy, we would offer them the opportunity to have no further intervention, so no radiation and no surgery. If there was still tumor, they could undergo radiation, and then again, we could potentially omit surgery if those two treatments together worked so well that the cancer was gone. Um, and you know, to our excitement, what we've seen so far is that every single patient that has been treated on our study with immunotherapy alone has had a complete response. So the tumor has completely disappeared just with immunotherapy and we have not had to have uh, radiate anyone nor has anyone undergone surgery. Um, and this is critically important because again, the, the side effects of radiation and surgery are really significant. Up to 30% of our patients need a permanent colostomy. And so these patients had their tumor completely treated just with immunotherapy felt great, we did not see any significant toxicity, um, and felt like they did years before they even noticed uh, you know, symptoms from their tumor. Um, so that's been a really successful and exciting finding for us in rectal cancer. And, and we've seen in colon cancer also in early stage in a different study where the patients received immunotherapy that had MSI high early stage colon cancer, and then went to surgery. So the difference here is that they still had the surgical approach, which was the standard approach, but when they looked at the tumor under the microscope pathologically, almost 70% of them, the tumor was completely gone. So they wouldn't have needed surgery at all because they had no cancer remaining. And this particular study only gave one month of immunotherapy. So this just really taught us that these early stage MSI high tumors are incredibly sensitive to immunotherapy. Um, and because of this, we're continuing our study in rectal cancer and we've expanded this study to now all solid tumors that are mismatch repair deficient, so, or MSI high. So liver cancer, esophagus, gastric, as long as they have that mismatch repair deficiency, which enables the immune system to be engaged, we're treating them in the early stage with immunotherapy to see if we might be able to duplicate this 
affect this incredibly um, you know, strong response and potentially omit radiation or surgery. Uh, because in those diseases, when we do surgery for you know, esophagus cancer, patients don't have an esophagus challenging to eat, it changes the quality of life forever. And so if we can achieve the same kind of response with immunotherapy, um, that would be you know, incredible in terms of the quality of life of the patients. Um, and then of course, there's the question of why does it work so well um, in, in early stage disease? As I mentioned, it works very well in metastatic disease, but this, this is a hundred percent response so far um, in, in early stage disease with six months of therapy. And I'll let Dr. Diaz maybe comment on that portion of the question. Yeah, no, we're really trying to understand that because in the metastatic disease, we'll get a 10 to 20% complete response rate. But in the early stage disease, we get a hundred percent complete response rate. So there has to be other factors at play. And what we're trying to decipher, is it tumor intrinsic? So something special about the tumor, maybe it's younger, maybe it, there's something different about it. Or is it tumor extrinsic? Is it something outside like a microbiome? Is there something special about certain locations in the body? But as, as Dr. Sursek mentioned, we're incredibly excited about the impact that this is gonna have in other parts of the body, in addition to the rectum and in addition to the colon. Uh, and so I think over the next few years, there will be continued excitement for this approach, but it's also transformative in the patient's lives. It's not just a very cool science paper. It's not just a, an interesting incremental finding. You're drastically changing the lives of these patients who normally would have had life-altering surgery, life-altering radiation and chemotherapy, um, and essentially omitting all of those things with just immunotherapy. Uh, for us, it's been an unbelievable journey uh, that's just getting started. It's got to be so rewarding to see those kind of results, um, especially in, in the younger patients and knowing that they're going to go on to have families and to, to have a better quality of life than they might have had had they developed this 10 years ago. Um, so that's, that's really exciting. Uh, however, you know, you've, you've said a lot about the MSI high but uh, you also said that's about only, what, 20% of, of colorectal cancer patients, maybe less? Um, probably probably and, less than that, yeah. About 10, yeah. 10 to 15%. Uh, and as you go up in stage, the frequency goes down. So it's the most abundant in the early stage disease. And in the metastatic, mm -hmm. it's, it's significantly less, probably less than 5% in the metastatic. So what are we learning from those MSI high patients whose immune systems can see the tumor and attack it? Uh, because of that, mu those mutations. Uh, what are we learning from that? And can we apply any of those lessons to the majority of colorectal cancers that are so-called cold uh, immunologically, that the immune yeah. system can't really see them or infiltrate? You know, I think it's a fascinating question, both scientifically and clinically. You know, can we, can we use the tools that have worked so well in certain subsets of cancers for can tumors that are not responsive? Um, and the, I'd, I'll let me start with the bad news. The bad news is that tumors are oftentimes born to go down a pathway of being immunogenic or born to be, go down a pathway of being non-immunogenic. Now, that's my personal hypothesis. Um, but how do you convert those tumors that are not immunogenic, that don't respond to the immune system, that are the immune deserts that I showed in that slide? And I think that there are a variety of different strategies that people are attempting. One way is combining it with other immunotherapies to see if that will jumpstart an immune response. Um, one of the more creative approaches is by some investigators at Memorial Sloan Kettering and some investigators in Europe where they're trying to give chemicals or drugs to change the genetics of the tumor, induce many mutations and make it more immunogenic. So turn them from really from hot, from cold to hot. Um, but there's a lot, it's a, it's a super long road still. And I think that's, that's a challenge, but there's so much more coming. So, we'll get there. Uh, yes. Uh, it sounds like, uh, and this is the nature of research, uh, you find answers, but those answers lead to more questions and, and the quest goes on. And uh, I know that researchers like you, uh, physician scientists, won't stop until you know, every patient can be cured um, with immunotherapy uh, or just cured in general. But of course, immunotherapy seems to offer certain advantages over some of those other forms of treatment, either alone or in combination. So. Really exciting to hear. I'm sorry that we've run out of time. Um, this is a truly fascinating subject. 
Um, I know colorectal cancer, it, as we talked about, is on the on the rise um, with young patients. And as populations grow, as people grow older, their risk of cancer generally increases as well. So always good to know what's happening in colorectal cancer. It's good to know that immunotherapy lessons there can be applied to uh, many other cancer types. Let's, uh, be, before we wrap, I'd like to ask each of you, you know, uh, many people watching this may be encountering a colorectal cancer diagnosis for the first time or maybe learning about immunotherapy or clinical trials for the first time. Any advice you would give patients who are just starting out on this journey? Let's start with Dr. Sirsek on that. I think most importantly, um, you know, it is, I think the most important thing is to be optimistic, um, to keep fighting. Um, I think it's critically important as a patient to advocate for yourself, to seek out someone in terms of care that you're comfortable with, um, and to, you know, probably reach out to support groups, et cetera, to be able to kind of navigate this journey, um, with the help of, of peers who might be going through the same thing and, and with the connections necessary if it gets to a point where um, treatments are no longer working and other treatments are necessary. Um, and so I think that those are really the critical things. And, and of course, and you know, I always say to, to my patients that, that a positive outlook is a huge, huge part of the fight. And um, we've made so many advances in really the last several years and, and more to come. And so that is the way I think about this is the marathon that we're all in together and, and the longer we go, the better our treatments will be. Dr. Diaz, any thoughts on uh, yeah, you know, science think, and what it will look like in 10 years? You know, I think um, things will only continue to improve. Um, and, uh, and I think they're going to continue to improve because of research and research can fall in a lot of different buckets. One is fundamental basic science. So just understanding basic mechanisms, biology, and, and chemistry and physics. The next bucket is how do you begin to apply those in translational medicine? And then the final bucket is how do you clinically develop those in unique ways to really impact patients? And I think Dr. Sirsek and I are fortunate in that our, our research has, we've had the good fortune of touching patients' lives with our research in a significant way. Um, but we have to continue to do that. And this success will build, will be the foundation of additional success by our group or other groups around the world. And there are curious, highly motivated individuals who are working hard uh, for patients and for the future of humanity that I think are gonna come up with new things. So I'm really excited about that. And I think that I suspect that in the next five to 10 years, you're gonna see a continuing diminishing in, in mortality from cancer. And in addition, you're gonna see less surgeries. You're gonna see less uh, life-altering things that we currently do with patients, those are no longer going to be an issue. Um, and so if you're newly diagnosed and it's scary and a lot of things are going on, go to your go to a, a reputable NCI designated cancer center. You'll get the latest and greatest there. doesn't mean you have to get all your treatment there, but at least touch base. It's your life and it's a very, very significant diagnosis. That's a great advice we've heard in some of our other sessions. Even if you can't get to one of those NCI designated comprehensive cancer centers, always worth a phone call and checking in and uh, just hearing about your options. And of course, with telehealth, telemedicine, there's a lot more we can do now uh, for folks who are distant from those treatment centers. So with that, Dr. Uh, Sirsik, Dr. Diaz, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, those of you watching, thanks. I hope you got uh, some good information out about immunotherapy for colorectal cancer. If you'd like to learn more, go to the Cancer Research Institute website, cancerresearch.org. If you're interested in finding a clinical trial, please consider making an appointment with one of our clinical trial navigators. They're free, confidential one-on-one -on -one appointments. Email us at patients at cancerresearch.org to set that up.